Thank you, Tom, and thank you, everybody, for coming out. The topic is the future of the junior resource sector. And I have to say, um, in the 30 years or plus that I've been in this industry, I don't think the future has looked bleaker for that Canadian institution called the Exploration Junior than ever before. And today I'm going to walk you through all the problems that face the sector, but I'm also going to present some solutions as to how this sector can be kept alive. We've just been through basically the crowning achievement of Canadian explorers. In the last decade, $140 billion worth of takeover bids. Juniors that uh, were taken over by majors where everybody got absolute liquidity. This was linked to the super cycle and the gold bubble of the past decade. This cycle is now coming to an end. Here you can see, if you ignore that uh, drop in value traded uh, in 2008-9, uh, that we have been through a tremendous bull cycle, and we are now in a very serious bear cycle. But what you really should look there is the red columns. That is private placement activity by TSX venture companies. Most of them that ended up getting taken over did so after migrating to the TSX. The TSX Venture Exchange has been the fountain of $39 billion of funding for the resource sector, and the payoff was $140 billion worth of buyouts. And here's how the unfortunate situation looks right now. Over there in the red oval are uh, nearly 700 companies that have negative working capital out of the uh, 1,700 or so that we track through Kaiser Research Online. In the yellow, we have uh, nearly 20% have less than $500,000 working capital. In other words, insufficient money to actually do anything unless they are so fortunate as to have a farm out to a well-funded partner. And where the hope still resides is in that green area, companies that have, between, uh, uh, have more than $500,000 working capital, about 600 companies. Uh, my prediction is that, the, or my assessment is, that we really only need 600 serious publicly listed jun exploration juniors. The stuff in the, on the, 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 the 900 or so companies that are underwater have little chance of surviving. And here you can see sort of the distribution um, uh, where, where the working capital that's still in the system exists. The green represent companies that have positive working capital. The red represents uh, negative working capital companies, and it's all divided according to price ranges. We've got uh, companies uh, um, trading below a dime owing $1.3 billion. Almost $2 billion is owed to the support industry that uh, provides services to these resource juniors. This money is never going to be paid back. This is a hit that the accountants are still waiting to take. Uh, in the entire community that isn't just the juniors, but the people who are owed money by the juniors. And here's the distribution of which parts of Canada are going to take the hit. Vancouver, where most of the companies are headquartered, is going to take a nearly billion dollar hit. And Ontario is going to get a $600 million hit. And the juniors have been dealing with this by going through a massive binge of rollbacks. And, uh, during the last cycle, a lot of financings got done that blew mar market capitalizations up to 100 million plus shares. This is unprecedented. It made it look like the Australian Stock Exchange. And uh, with the arrival of high frequency trading, and uh, it has become very difficult for these companies to go anywhere. And so the companies are going back to the 80s model of rolling back the stock severely, tightening the structure and basically making it difficult for the algo traders to be in the market. Unfortunately, the consequence are companies with tiny market caps. You know, what is it here? I got a 40% 40, 40 have market caps of less than 2 million. Uh, so now we have a, a fresh dilution treadmill. You can't really manipulate the price of these up in the way you did in the old days because nobody wants to put real money in at the inflated prices. So we have a problem getting meaningful capital into treasuries without horrific uh, dilution. And it also means that the, 
the management teams, the entrepreneurs who are supposed to be coming up with the ideas and, and all that, uh, are going to end up with really tiny stakes in the companies where, where they are supposed to create new wealth. And here we got uh, like 900 companies trading below a dime, um, 864 with less than 200,000 working capital. Uh, those that still have more than 200,000 capital are evenly divided between feasibility demonstration companies, which are ones where you already have a resource estimate and are trying to uh, demonstrate that it's uh, feasible at the current uh, metal prices. And then the other half is roughly the old-fashioned companies that are trying to make a brand new discovery. So, is it just cyclical or is this time different? And I think to understand the future, one needs to look at the past. So I'm going to very quickly walk through my 30 years that I've been in this industry and try and highlight the things that made each of the bull and bear cycles stand out to create a context for discussing what the problems are today going forward. So the first bull market that I experienced was the uh, first gold bubble in 1978 to 80 when gold ran from sort of $200 all the way to 850 before settling back to $400. Um, prior to that, the basic Canadian exploration model was to uh, raise money before the exploration season began, get some sort of promotion going, sell all the options and shares that the insiders own into a public uh, which tried to basically uh, beat the insiders by not owning the stock when, when the season came, came to an end and results rolled in. And that had repeated itself over and over again and once in a while it discovered in a, it resulted in a real discovery. After 79, we had a window where suddenly all this, uh, uh, what had become high hanging fruit at $35 gold became very low hanging fruit. It was, uh, well, you know, uh, when, when gold stabilized at $400 from uh, $35 in, in 1972, that was a 400% real gain. To put that into current context, after 30 years, if you inflation adjust $400 gold forward, you end up with a number of 1150 right now. Gold is bumbling around 12, 1220 or something like that, maybe 15% up in real terms. Except the situation today is far worse, far worse than, 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 it, than it looks there because during those 30 years, 2.3 billion new ounces were mined courtesy of this higher real price so that the above ground gold stock now sits at 5.4 billion ounces worth about six, seven trillion dollars right now. There is no low-hanging fruit left to harvest. If the world wants more physical gold than exists, it's going to have a hard time getting it from the mines because at these current gold prices, it is not feasible to mine an awful lot of new gold. The mines that are in production, they'll continue for a while, but the will to develop significant new mines at these prices um, is, is, is very muted right now. And that also gives cause to believe that higher real prices, something in the order of $2,000 or higher, is feasible within the next uh, five to eight years. But the problem is it may take several years to get out of the current rut. And while that's not a problem for the majors who just sort of, uh, uh, you know, curl, and, and curl up and uh, wait for it to end, for the juniors, this is a potential death, especially since this market is obsessed with where gold is trending. So, inflation was the reason gold shot to 850, and we know what Paul Volcker did. He ran interest rates up to 22% to strangle inflation, created a serious uh, uh, recession. Um, during that 78 to 81 boom, uh, Vancouver Stock Exchange uh, brokerage firms, uh, they allowed margin over $2. We saw stocks soar into the double digits as people borrowed on top of the uh, you know, inflated value of their positions to buy more of the same position. Um, that ended up in a horrific collapse, and we had a pretty bad bear market in the junior resource sector. And it was around that time with gold settled back to $400 and inflation under control 
That's when the sort of gold bug mantra came into effect, that $2,000 is just around the corner. And for 30 years, we heard this story, $2,000 is just around the corner. But of course, it was not possible because the mining industry was shoveling 2.3 billion ounces of new gold out of the ground during that period, and the central banks had decided gold was obsolete and were also busy liquidating it uh, in most cases. But we got rescued by Murray Pezum, who was insane enough to drill 80 holes in the midst of a bear market on a project in an area that the experts had dismissed as having a metamorphic grade that made it unlikely that serious gold deposits would have survived that had formed earlier in the Archean. And the result on that, on this fabulous uh, persistence, uh, of this fabulous persistence was a 20 million ounce gold deposit which uh, dragged the sector out of uh, its doldrums, pulled me into the industry. Uh, I ended up getting a temporary job uh, because my broker needed somebody to file all his stuff. He was too busy on the phone. And I, I personally never left the industry. The 80s was a period of discoveries. Um, uh, we had a flow through funding come into play. Uh, we had a, um, the Casa Berardi play legitimized the whole flow through funding process. But what made the industry tick was brokers were still network hubs that were meaningful. All information was on paper, maybe Stockwatch and George Cross newsletter was a source of uh, you know, daily news for people who could get the mail on a daily basis. But brokers broke down into two categories. There were those who were real brokers who gathered up the information and spun it back to their clients and tried to get them to trade wisely. And then there were the other type, the mushroom brokers, the one who uh, had a relationship with a promoter who would run a boiler room or phone room of some sort and they would find the clients or, or, the, or, or, or the marks, steer them to this broker who would open the account, put them into that stock that they'd been touted on, and basically just fed them manure and kept them in the dark about what was really going on. And when those positions blew up as they inevitably did, well, those clients left, but it didn't matter because the promoters shoveled a whole new set of clients. That was the client generation model uh, that characterized a good part of the 80s. We also had uh, uh, private placements with 12-month hold periods, which hardly anybody did except insiders ahead of restructuring after a rollback. Uh, so they invented exempt institutions, which if you were a supposed offshore bank in Switzerland or the Cayman Islands, you could do a private placement that was immediately free trading. And uh, it, it was partly bad, partly good. Bad because insiders used it to uh, uh, create paper uh, and without disclosing that it was them and that they were doing the selling, but also good because it enabled capital to flow into the treasuries of the juniors at fairly high prices because the insiders would, would sell the stock uh, you know, pretty much after they got it and they'd finance the companies that way. And another plague of the 80s was that uh, the trading floor and the trading desk still existed and these were huge front-running systems where uh, you know, the, the brokers were screwed and the clients were screwed because these guys would look at the order flow coming in and nearly always front-run the direction of the order. At the same time as the resource sector was flourishing reasonably well, the Vancouver Stock Exchange uh, uh, mutated into a non-resource type of story. And that's where a whole bunch of IPOs were floated with very very uh, thin, thin public floats, and they would acquire some strange story like Chop Computers or Sky High, in the case of Sky High, they were going to acquire the, an arms dealer's uh, bankrupt oil assets. And these things ran to fifty hundred dollars or so in pre-split terms, and uh, they gave new life to uh, David Baines and Adrian Duplessis, who became sort of a scourge of the Vancouver Stock Exchange. And the 80s sort of ended with a couple of negative uh, articles, uh, one a book called Fleecing the Lamb, and the other the scam capital of the world. So we descended after the 87 crash, we descended into a, a bear market. It also overlapped with an economic recession. 
During this period, the Matkin Commission tried to figure out why the VSE had such a bad reputation. They invented the reverse takeover mechanism as a way of formalizing the acquisition of these uh, strange stories that companies were acquiring. And, and they largely figured out that there was a serious disclosure problem, that companies weren't really making clear what they were doing. They insisted on balance sheets now being included with uh, quarterly statements, which uh, the dumb Australians still don't do this on their quarterlies. Um, a balance sheet is the most important page in financials if you follow the junior resource sector. So this helped people understand what was the most important number, like how much money did the company have left and how fast was it spending it. During that period, we had some isolated uh, discovery plays. We had the whole Stikine Arch area play emerge when SNP and SK Creek uh, came, on, came on the scene. And at the same time, we started seeing a new type of story, the bulk tonnage porphyry, Friedland's Fort Knox gold deposit and uh, Hunter Dickinson's Mount Milligan. Both got taken over. But during this period, the capital did not get recycled. It was, uh, it was simply... Uh, uh, put in the bank. And brokers ended up quitting, getting jobs as taxi drivers or house painters. The Americans shut down uh, their broker's ability to buy Canadian stocks by inventing the penny stock rule where you couldn't very easily buy it for your client unless you had a stock was over five dollars. In other words, you could only buy seriously overpriced junk. 92 to 96 was the great discovery boom. Um, and. Uh, it got kicked off with the diamond discovery Diamet made, ICADI. It basically changed the diamond industry. All of a sudden, here was a new commodity nobody knew anything about. The fact that nobody knew anything about it resulted two years later in the Tliqui Cho bust, which wiped out $1 billion in diamond-related market cap in one instant. Uh, we had a bit of a bear after that. But then Robert Friedland, a diamond company, found the Voises Bay deposit which ended up being a $4 billion buyout. Um, during this period, we also had the opening of the third world frontiers. In 93, that's when we started hearing about Kilometer 88 in Venezuela and all the gold that could be had there. And so a whole group of juniors moved into Latin America and acquired prospects that had been dormant for decades because the countries had turned into either left-wing or right-wing dictatorships where nothing could be done. And we had a, you know, Perina being discovered. We had a bunch of other major deposits that didn't quite work but impressed the market quite well. And in 95, Briex came along with its 100 million ounce discovery. And what was uh, wonderful about Briex was it wasn't just the usual industry suspects that made all the money. Everybody made money. There were mom and pops who owned the stock. There were the, uh, the people down in San Diego who owned the stocks. There were newsletter writers, clients who owned the stocks. There were, uh, you know, um, brokerage, you know, more senior type brokerage firm uh, uh, brokers who owned the stock. And the fact that everybody was making money enabled this fraud to carry on. The 90s were also important in that deregulation uh, made it tough for brokers to just grind their clients 3% in, 3% out, uh, you know, running it every 10 days on the uh, payment cycle. Um, so retail investors moved to the discount brokers. Um, during this period, there was still not a lot of information available. The internet was still in its infancies. Newsletter writers, mining analysts, we all became gurus. We could move markets from the podium or by publishing, publishing something. But the internet stock forums began to emerge. There was one character called George Chalikas who managed to get huge whirlwinds of market activity going through sort of off-color commentaries about stuff. And this was the beginning of the shift away from brokers being network hubs. One of the big problems facing the junior sector, resource sector, is that there are no more network hubs. The information uh, that the brokers used to channel and, uh, and make available, that's now ubiquitous and therefore it has no form, there is no mystery, there are no rumors anymore. So of course the 97 to 2002 bear market after Briex was revealed as a fraud, people were completely devastated. Um, the credibility of the Canadian explorers was called into question. There were a number of other frauds like uh, Timbuktu and Golden Rule uh, 
uh, which, which also you know, caused the stocks to hit double digits uh, before flaming out. And the, the regulatory industry and the mining industry responded by creating CEDAR, a fabulous reporting system, which uh, I understand they're actually thinking of uh, uh, making a lousy reporting system by uh, having it redone, perhaps in the lousy manner of SETI, which they later invented, uh, the insider trading reporting system, which has about one of the worst user interfaces in the world. During this period, we had isolated plays, Veladoro uh, made, made it as a big discovery in, in, Ar in, in Argentina, uh, and uh, Snap Lake came along, but none of this really spread into the other juniors. And during this period, even though the internet was coming, we started seeing these $250,000 mass mailouts to like, like million people mailouts with some big long article on some macro theme and buried inside it would be the pump of some, some obscure little junior. And of course, in 1999, I remember being told by my subscribers, get with it, resource sector's dead, we know how to quantify their upside, it's always finite thanks to the size of the deposit and the metal price and the costs associated with mining it. Uh, get into the internet stuff. There are sky's the limit with it. And as it started going exponential in late 99, the juniors abandoned ship, tried to get into dot com. The regulators immediately shut this down by inventing the change of business rule, which halted these stocks and they had to do all kinds of paperwork. By the time that was done, the dot com bubble was over. At the same time, the gold uh, dollar, gold leasing uh, dollar carry trade, of which Barrick was, a, was a, the architect, helped gold down to $255 and wiped out gold as something anybody cared about. Then in 2003, the decade that we have just finished, China came out of nowhere, caught the mining industry by surprise. It was forward selling all its metal production until about 2006 when they finally figured out the word super cycle. Robert Friedland had already pounded the podium in 2003 saying China is going exponential. It is going to push up demand for raw materials big time. Uh, this was a period where the private placement hold period was reduced to uh, uh, four months rather than 12 months. And 12 months was too long because a typical expiration play uh, had, was already a bust by the time 12 months were over. This allowed one to get money and, and be ready to sell the stock by the time the drills started turning. And the brokerage industry, which was no longer making money on trading con commissions, switched to uh, 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 um, this clip and flip strategy of just churning private placements at 8 to 12 percent. Uh, commissions, and as soon as it was free trading, they would blow it out and just keep the warrant and hope that they got lucky on the fundamental side. And this was a period also where if you were a bottom fisher, you were out of luck because all the big plays were about taking discarded assets from past exploration cycles, stuffing them into a private company, and then merging it with a capital pool through an RTO while it was halted, doing tiers of financings where, where all the button pushers are in at this level, all the intermediaries here, and then the public finally here when it got public. But the interesting thing about this past decade is by acquiring existing deposits, we shifted away from exploration to feasibility demonstration. And that attracted the institutional audience because suddenly they could put numbers down on pencil with on, on paper. They could plug in what they thought the metal price was going to be in the future and they could see what the resource was and they could figure out from the manuals what the uh, costs were going to be. And they would use the discounted cash flow model to figure out what the these stocks should be priced at. They don't know how to do that with the juniors. We had several uh, good discoveries in the past decade. Uh, we had the Eleanor discovery by Virginia Gold that got bought out for $750 million without a resource estimate in place. And uh, we had uh, um, Fruta del Norte, Aurelian's discovery. They spent $19 million to come up with nothing and then they drilled an undercover target and came up with a 14 million ounce deposit. Unfortunately, resource nationalism destroyed that story. And as sort of a last hurrah, we had the Ring of Fire area play in Northern Ontario, which was happening, it was kind of like a, a end of a century type, type, type event where, or end of the world type event where we already could see the uh, securitized mortgage problem. Um, 
an enormous amount of money that companies, juniors had in their treasury evaporated because they were parked in this safe Coventry commercial paper. But yet we saw all this money pour into this sector and nothing of great consequence emerged from it. And that really was the end of the great Canadian area play as something that drives the Canadian juniors. We got blindsided in 2008 by the financial crisis. The, the, super, the super cycle was still going strong, and, uh, and, uh, but uh, the liquidity uh, crisis uh, ended up uh, tanking all that. Uh, at the end of this, uh, Friedland kind of said, I'm staying with the super cycle narrative. Eric Sprott, who had been a champion of the super cycle narrative, he switched to the apocalyptic gold bug narrative. And uh, the last sort of four, three, three years have been dominated by this narrative. Now, the second gold bubble came along with all these uh, predictions about uh, fiat currency debasement, hyperinflation, conspiracies, and so on. Uh, guys like uh, Paulson ended up buying stocks like Nova Gold, which required a substantially re higher real price. But the problem with the whole gold bug narrative is that uh, if your $3,000 price is coming because of inflation, why would that make Dolan Creek any more valuable then than it is now? Obviously, costs are going to rise. So there was an incoherence in the narrative. And the market started to get this in, in late uh, 2010. It also started to understand that the, the gold narrative had been hijacked and turned into a, uh, an ideological icon for sort of anti-government, uh, libertarian type thinking. And of course, many of the political decisions were dominated by this. And uh, we had the super cycle killed because there was an inadequate uh, fiscal response to the uh, crisis. We've had simply a monetary response. All of that is now coming to an end. And now we're into the long bear market. Fukushima killed what the, the, the revival of the uranium bubble that had run during the last decade. Um, the rare earth boom that we saw ended up being killed by simple end user substitution. Uh, the capitulation of climate change as something we should care about uh, wiped out the interest in critical metals, which were part of the whole sort of renewable energy spectrum. And uh, in, in April of 2013, Goldman Sachs and the rest basically orchestrated a smackdown of not just gold, but this whole narrative saying that we need to plunge the country into austerity and create a Great Depression for the sake of this seven, six trillion dollar gold market and put at risk the 200 or the 80 trillion dollar global economy and the hundreds of trillion dollars of real world assets in which Wall Street has its fingers. And right now we are going through a transition where um, we will uh, have to purge this old narrative out of the system and we may see the thousand dollar gold that the Goldman Sachs of the world want. There is an alternative narrative. I am out of time here and cannot really get into it, but I have talked about it extensively, and that is to actually look at the global economy, growth of it as the engine for gold demand. Not hysteria about the apocalypse that's just around the corner, but global economic growth. And if you just look at the this situation here, the long-term picture is the United States is in relative decline unless the world goes into a global depression and China and everything goes down. And with this long-term relative decline, the fabric of the future changes, the status of the US dollar as the single reserve currency changes, uncertainty populates a future that is actually a future of prosperity. And you can see the green is the projected global economic growth. Right now, we hear the IMF is going to even curtail this. This is bearish for gold. If you look at gold as simply a, the value of it as a percentage of global GDP, what we call the price bubble wasn't that big a price bubble. It was only about halfway to where it was in, in 1980. And if you assume something like 10% as the level of, uh, that it's going to be as new wealth piles up and parks some of itself into gold as a long-term hedge against the uncertainty of a world economic uh, power balance changing and convert that back, this is the kind of price performance you can see for gold. 
And this is our real price performance, not an inflation-adjusted performance. So by 2020, I can see $2,000 gold as a real price, but it's going to be slow. And you can see you know, three to $4,000 on the upside in the case of a serious geopolitical stressor. And you can see the uh, downside, $500 in the case of a global depression. Thank you.